businesses of the plumbing and pipe fitting industry of the United States and Canada represents approximately 364,000 plumbers, pipe fitters, sprinkler fitters, HVACR service technicians, welders, and pipeliners working in the construction industry throughout North America. The UA is present in many important sectors of our economy. Skilled UA members touch virtually every aspect of people's lives, from homes to schools to businesses, including commercial and institutional, energy and infrastructure, fabrication, fire protection, HVACR, industrial, medical and pharmaceutical, and even residential and water safety. Once you become a UA member, there are many career paths you can choose. Starting as an apprentice, the UA provides many training opportunities to grow and develop into a highly skilled journey level worker. The training programs provide you the certifications and credentials you will need to succeed. You decide how far you will go, become a designer, a contractor, a business owner, a foreman, or go big and help the next generation of trade workers and become an instructor, organizer, or UA official. HVAC Excellence is a proud partner of the UA, providing extended learning and career opportunities for our post-secondary and vocational students. Well, thank you everyone for joining Did You Know, the ESCO HVAC show. Mr. Rich Minkowski, thank you so much for joining us, sir. How are you today? No, oh, real good, real good. Glad to be here. And uh, that was very nice to see uh, 449 is actually my home level. That's what I remember. Oh, boy, I have a special place in my heart at the 449 after visiting there a few months ago. I can tell you it is an amazing place. So what we're here today is to talk about this evolution of our industry and to help paint this bigger, better picture of what HVAC and refrigeration is. You know, a lot of people are uh, traumatized by that perspective of what a furnace is because they've only been introduced to the dirty old furnace that's in the closet in the back of the house, right? They don't see this big, beautiful industry that is available to them. So we have these wonderful partnerships with UA where we help instructors prepare their students for the industry and then show them what some of the options are as they get out into the industry and look for the bigger and better opportunities because they're out there. And if you're hungry for a career in the industry, if you're hungry to make a change to the world that we live in, there are a lot of jobs waiting for you out there in the world. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about how our world and how our industry has been changing and ways that we can prepare for things that are really coming down a pipeline. Well, that, that was uh, well, well said, uh, Clifton, and, and also uh, you hit it right on with the opportunities. And, it, and mm -hmm. really, it matters not whether you are you know, part of an organization like Local 449 or the UA. Everybody in the street, everybody that, that you know, works out of a truck with tools is part of this. Everybody that we teach to go into the truck with tools is part of this evolution and is has some you know, responsibility yeah. to keep learning through our whole careers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's not the same industry that it was even five years ago, especially 10 or 20 years ago. And the things that are coming, man, they're really going to sculpt an entirely new level of technician capabilities and education. Yeah, you are correct. And, and when you look at the age, the median age of a lot of the techs out there, you're right, there's going to be a, a, a large need for many, many technicians uh, to do the work and, and and to be knowledgeable of the new yeah. equipment coming up. Sure. So let's talk about some of the things that we're going to see going forward. All right, well, you know, these are some of the topics we're going to hit on today. We're going to, you know, do, do a lot of uh, uh, discussion about where we were, where we're going, and what, what the challenges are. Yeah. Um, you know, we'll first take a few minutes to describe the cultural, technical, and practical ideologies that have evolved in the built environment for the past 50 years. And let's let's go back to 74, chemist Frank Sherwood Rowland 
of the University of California, Irvine, and his postdoctoral mm -hmm. student, <clears throat> Mario Molina, suggested that long-lived halogen compounds such as chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs could reach the stratosphere where they could be disassociated by UV light. Little did we know. Reacts. In effect, Roland and Molina began a planetary transition to environmentally safe building strategies. This eventually led to creating high-performance building standards for saving energy and conserving water. Wow. And along the way, the stakeholders were challenged to learn, unlearn, and relearn, as you already mentioned, core elements of building operations. Yeah. So for more than a generation, energy consumption has been measured and monitored. As a society, we all once we know the number, and more importantly, the annual cost tied to that number, we work hard to reduce those audited numbers. This resulted in the manufacturing of people to move the needle to the highest efficiencies possible. Manufacturing and engineering communities have responded by increasing fossil fuel burner efficiency rates. Capabilities, yeah. Yeah, and, and they, every every component now is optimized in all building systems. Yep. When Royal and Molina released their balloon, no one was uncomfortable with a space heater wasting 30% of the heat through the food pipe. Exactly. The, you know, the, the staple that T87 thermostat, current heating and cooling system. My favorite thermostat. 100% <laughs> and then off. So compared to our grandparents and maybe even our parents, we yeah. now live in high performance buildings. Absolutely. We came yeah. a long way in really 50 years of a change in our entire industry. So in over a 50 year span, we've completely moved our technology and looked into as high of efficient a capabilities we have. And along with that, we have to be able to maintain the performance of these newer systems. Exactly. And even down board, energy conservation led us to saving water consumed by plumbing fixtures. Yeah, sure. And additionally, energy was conserved by lowering the hot water temperature to hover, hover not get into, but hover above the amplification ranges for pathogens. So in today's environment, we need a balance between water age, water temperature, and, and water quality. And that too is another whole set of challenges. Sure, absolutely. Oh, well, while it's thinking here, we have to re always remember that the common denominator is gonna be heat transfer. I was told a long time ago, I'm in the business of moving heat. That, that That's correct. and. It's funny you should frame it that way as being in the business because yeah. we're going to talk later about how it will be a business yeah. um, of trading BTUs. Sure. So, yeah. You know, we've heard, we've both heard from manufacturers or at Max Tech. Yeah, what is that? Um, engineered with control measures to conserve water and reduce energy consumption. Oh. The universal laws of physics maintain that heat can only flow in one direction. The cold, so the manufactured product for compressor bearing systems becomes at max tech. And we're reminded by physicist Mark Mills, engineers are really good at making things better, but yep. they can't make them better than the laws of physics permit. Okay, so we are we approaching that point of maxing out our efficiency of our equipment? I I, I believe we are, but we're gonna learn, you know, we're gonna discuss today too that there may be one spot left. That, you know, heat will flow downhill by itself. No material on the planet can prevent it to move from the a BTU to move from warmer to colder circumstances. So th these three devices on the screen now move three mediums uphill through the built environment: pumps, fans, and compressors, and they water, air, and refrigerant. Sure. Variable speed controls direct every component to follow the occupant load profiles by increasing or decreasing motor speeds. Yep. Both controls are then metered to the equipment to match the speed. So decoupling temperature and humidity has been normalized for all, all consumers. Everything that can be accomplished to manipulate every moving part. Let's think about that. Every moving part of every system is known. So what's the next frontier beyond max tech? And as an industry, you know, we, we're always pushing the envelope. Yep. So what, what's left to push? Boy, that really does bring up an interesting perspective because we think about when we went from, you know, single stage pumps and fans and compressors into two stage pumps and fans and compressors, and now into modulating capacity pumps and fans and compressors, doesn't leave us another realm to develop besides just the way that we move the heat. 
the way that we move it, or what about the amount of heat we're trying to move? Oh, okay. Let's let's go back to some heat transfer principles. Until today, and I'm and and I'll, I'll come back to that reference. Until today, uh, medium water day, refrigerant is one of the mediums that'll move heat from where we do not want it to where we do not care. Isn't that? HVAC 101. That's yeah, us. DPUs out of the house, we throw them outside. Put them someplace we don't need them. Every day, all day. So the mass in the refrigerator circulated in the piping is weight in pounds. What if the medium was a medium was available for heat transfer that had less mass than the refrigerant now being pumped through the legacy systems? So a more efficient refrigerant. Well, why not circulate grams of refrigerant in lieu of pounds? So that means, as you said, efficiency of the refrigerant needs to increase. So would that give us less comp compressed horsepower and energy? So current trends in refrigerant selection by equipment manufacturers reveal kind of a back to the future reflection. Right. To, to further optimize compressor energy, OEMs circulate less mass <laughs> through the system. From the early 1900s, propane was advertised as an odorless uh, safety refrigerant it was introduced exactly. as a substitute for ammonia as a drop-in. Where have you heard the word drop-in? <laughs> That's right. That's so funny. I use this exact photo in one of my old refrigerant history trainings. And a lot of people, when I get to that, they go, what do you mean propane as a well over 100, almost 150-year-old refrigerant? I'm going, oh, yeah, propane has been around a long time. We just put it on the shelf for a while. Okay, so let's go back to the safety part of this. There meaning safe for the planet. Environmentally right. friendly refrigerants capture and release more BTUs per pound, or should I say grams, right. specifically by the compressor. So their global warming potential and ozone depletion potential quantities help the manufacturing community offer attractive, and I'll start, I'll kick it off, attractive heat pump solutions, mm -hmm. exactly. building orders to strive to lower the impact of the Earth's environment. Sure, because we really are moving to heat pumps. I mean, if we look at any high efficiency home, uh, it is not just a singular heat pump, it's multiple heat pumps. We had Bill Spohn on just a few months ago talking about high performance homes because he's been building one himself and living in one. And I think he had five different heat pumps that were associated to that system. Oh, sure. And I'm not surprised by that because that, that, that seems to be a simpler way to, to manage either zoning and optimize comfort. Certainly. Yeah. So that that showed it. That was a quick uh, slide showing some of the uh, full circle that we've come to. But in fact, the impact of climate change, we have reintroduced refrigerants to require safe handling techniques yes. to protect the occupants. Now. now we need to protect the occupants, the consumers. So we may need to retrain technicians. And also, let's not forget first responders who work safely in proximity yeah. to mildly flammable refrigerants. Who will encounter now, our equipment. That's right. So we're not talking about the skill sets, but let's look at a behavior modification. When buying, transporting, transporting, meaning the DOT may require an extra placard on the truck. Absolutely. For the contractor. <clears throat> Evacuating and what about disposing of modern mm -hmm. plant materials? Sure. But, but buyer beware. Let, let's also think of be intellectually honest about where we are now. There are some industry stakeholders that have not settled industry practice for safety sensor placement. Right. Or control measures in case of a leak or leak sensor placement even. Yeah, even for our A2Ls, let alone the A3s. Actually, exactly. So to safeguard the consumer from a leak in the evaporator, will there be a factory mounted sensor? Should should the fan stop if propane is sensed? Yeah, I know it's a big topic. Oh, well, there are some questions we're still waiting for consensus on. Uh, some in the industry even want a certain distance between the evaporator and the first supply grill off the plant. Sure. So what does that tell us? What are they worried about? So who determines that distance? You know, does it fall to the fuel? Does it fall to the factory? If the, if the sensor is field mounted, then how do we get a third party sensor integrated to a manufactured system? Yeah. So these are a lot of things educators may want to consider while we, we're in the transition mm -hmm. for those people. Yeah, there's a lot of unknown in this transition, not just with refrigerants. There are a lot of technologies that are in transition as well. So we have multiple aspects of our industry that are all moving at the same time at a very fast pace. So it's super important for us to gather in this community. We keep talking about this community or village of HVAC HVAC professionals. Well, we're here to help each other because there are people who are specializing in all different aspects of these transitions 
that want to be able to talk about it and that, just professionally bring it to the forefront. That, that's correct. And uh, just for the audience to understand too, uh, we're not working inside of our own silo here. Uh, first responders, the, the firemen are also worried about training and yeah. you know how much refrigerant is there? What do they do uh, if the house is on fire and the outdoor unit isn't yet compromised? There's, there's questions for them too. And, and they deserve the same answers that our techs deserve. You know, on, on and being able to work within uh, a nearby system that may or may not, you know, be a risk. And for sure, a lot of stakeholders are, are, are telling us, "Oh, don't worry, we did uh, flame propagation tests. We did this. We did that." Right. Okay. When you get out of your truck with your tool belt and you are, you know, approaching a system that you need to service. It's you and the system. We, we need to, you know, try to get to a comfort level for the consumer and for the tech. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my own son is a firefighter. And just a couple months ago, he uh, he gave me a call. And he said, hey, Dad, what do you know about flammable refrigerants going into air conditioners? Is that such a thing? I said, oh, boy, son, we got to sit down. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. That's right. But but, but in the, being in the trades, there were risks all the time. Oh, you yeah, know, absolutely. We're, we're, we're lifting uh, things. There are known risks, and just like uh, OSHA 10 training, which is behavior modification, you need to approach flammable refrigerants with a similar mindset that yeah. we, we need to behave a little bit differently. We're still going to put gauges on, we're still going to get tools out, we're still going to, you know, cut and, and braze pipe, but we want to be uh, recognize and identify those risks and behave accordingly. Absolutely. Alrighty, so you think it's time to talk about some of the uh, heat pump, water heaters, and all the sources? Yeah, that's a big one because we're starting to see more centralized water systems. So we're not just talking about heating water that's going to be used for domestic purposes. Now we're starting to look at, okay, what can we do with our heat? How can we transfer it? And what types of equipment are going to be heating and cooling, utilizing things like mediums like water? Okay, well, all good questions, and we have all good answers. That's all good news. Yeah. I'd this ideology still uses pumps, fans, and compressors to move water, air, and refrigerant, but right. now with a public health twist. Audible water is now introduced in the mechanical system as a source <coughs> for domestic hot water. Each manufacturer offers their own hybrid version for general consumption in the marketplace. Right. Comfort air system offer optimized distribution for the occupied space in the built environment, so why not apply a similar strategy you know, to, to domestic water? In the U.S., states and uh, utilities are incentivizing the application of high-performance mechanical systems, which utilize environmentally safe, again, heat transfer mediums right. to heat the potable water. Yep. So that brings us to another question, though. Who designs and installs this system in a way that protects them? <laughs> what yeah. impact will this have for, for building inspectors who delineate between potable or domestic water Yep. And hydronic or mechanical water. Which building permit is appropriate for this configuration? You know, across the landscape, will, will the craftsmen and women need to add a plumbing license to their EPA 608 credential? We're already starting to see that. That's a big topic just with the residential heat pump water heaters because there are states that are already looking at their mechanical contractor licenses and going, well, maybe we need to require a... HVAC mechanical license to add on a plumber or a plumber to add 608 recommendations. We've mm -hmm. also seen small jurisdictions um, setting that as an expectation for the contractor to be dual licensed. So I think we'll see a lot of changes just in this next couple of years for HVAC and plumbing licensing. Yeah, I, and a lot of our, uh, uh, tra you know, the UA, UA has about 309 training centers in the U.S. and Canada. Back in 2017, um, we started teaching, we started awarding it and allowing plumbers to earn their CFC license. Nice. And in Denver, actually, where, where, where Howard lives, yeah. those two locals, the, the plumbers go to get the other local to get their CFC license and the mechanics go to the plumbing local to get their plumbing license because hmm. nobody wants to, 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 to have a discussion on who's going to do what. And you don't send two trucks to, to somebody's house. Exactly. You solve it with proper credentialing, yeah. proper training. 
Um, and, and that's again, that's not a union issue. It's it's a trade issue. It's an industry issue. Sure, that's right. It cuts across all bonds. Anybody that's in the truck needs to have the proper creden- credentials, and that'll vary city by city. Absolutely. But more good more good news. We have federal agencies, the DOE, the New Buildings Institute, uh, Pacific Northwest uh, National, National Laboratories. Re- National Laboratories. They're building industry backstops to prepare for deployment of high performance infrastructure. So training for building officials, contractors, and service techs from the at the federal level will contain repeatable and reliable methods to ensure an informed rollout for consumers. So technical training, you know, we now need to consider a plumbing license option depending on the state and municipality uh, of the graduate, of the people who are graduating and, and their workplace. So challenges, obstacles, but guess what? We, we're always solving. That's, yeah. that's our day job. It, it's part of our industry. You know, there are times where I think about where I am in life right now and go, man, would it be fun to be a technician now instead of when I was entering it you know, 25 <laughs> years ago? You know, yeah. if you enjoy change and you enjoy challenges and opportunities and the ability to make a difference in the world, now is like the optimal time to be entering into our industry. And there are a lot of people that are teaching in our industry. I'm sure we have a lot of people today. And if you're an educator joining us today, let us know where you're at. Tell us what you're doing for programs, whether you're looking at new technologies and new styles of heat transfer and infrastructure, because it's definitely coming. And unfortunately, a lot of us older educators didn't grow up with the technology as much, so it's very new. So this is where you come to learn about these things. Because let's just talk about you know, these heat pump and potable water solutions that we're starting to see. I mean, do you see these coming to the United States in the very near future? Because I can tell you what's happening internationally. They're here. They're here. This drawing and is actually from one of the uh, uh, modules being developed. And spoiler alert, it's not about the piece of equipment. It's not about who sets the evaporator, the plumber or the uh, service staff. Contractor, right. It's about the pipe. The plumbing permit should reflect the potable water traveling through the evaporator. The mechanical permit will reflect the refrigerant traveling through the evaporator. So, Makes sense. you know, so it's the piping that determines because the plumber keeps the, the potable water safe. Yep. And the service technician makes sure that the uh, evaporator doesn't leak. So, if you hold both licenses, yeah, you're going to have both sides, both sides of that piece. So. That may sound a little confusing, but it's not. It's not no. as simple. And hey, the plumber's going to put the evaporator in. Well, no. why? He's going to put the refrigerator in. He's moving water. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that just a little, you know, preview of what may be to come. Oh, yeah. uh, some guidance from the federal level. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like opportunity to a contractor to me. Yeah, exactly. So as we move ahead, you know, let's. And we're looking at at some of this. Um, I always remind people: solar and wind always get the headlines above the fold. Sure, I see uh, a lot of it. Solutions, you know, though, will remain the only worldwide scalable solution because we have the equipment, we have techs in the field. Right. We work on heat pumps every day. We yeah. work on hot water tanks every day. But internationally, all this is identified as clean energy decarbonization or electrification. But all those roads still lead to heat pumps. All three term refer to similar strategies to manage heat transfer absent fossil fuels. So the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, have expanded their heat pump product families to meet this worldwide challenge, both commercially and residentially with equipment that's mass produced and that helps it to be affordable. Absolutely. I've seen a lot of products at the 2023 AHR Expo that was this. It was potable solutions for residential and commercial applications that I knew were coming. I just hadn't seen them land. And they're absolutely here. And you've seen some pretty clever things, I'm Mm -hmm. sure. You know, we'll look at that. So, um, but I I want to remind everybody, let's just take a minute and get off the equipment and get off the heat pump for a second. And and just talk about non-traditional sources that already are impacting the HVACR industry. Yeah, so there's another operational dimension we can't ignore. And sorry to use a cliche here, Clinton. I'm sorry to say this because it's a cliche, but data is the new oil. <laughs> IBM and Google are in the game. Yeah. Do IBM and Google make the stuff we're putting in? No. But trust me when I tell you they're here. So 
I want to ask who remembers the disruption of 2014. How many of us were early adopters to the Nest thermostat? Oh, this boy. is extremely popular very quickly, but not for the reasons you may think. Right. You know, at, at, at first, the Nest device behaved like a digital T87. Yep. System on, system off. System yep. on, system off. Yeah, it was easy to install. There was a YouTube video that any homeowner can put it on their wall in 15 minutes. It was sold at yeah. box stores when it first yeah. came out. That was its primary market. Oh, and, and it sold like wildfire. So, yeah. and it would work with any heating and cooling system. But did this thermostat manage the variable speed components to reduce energy? Not really. No. Did Nest decouple temperature any minute enough? When Google bought Nest, they bought a device that harvests data right where you live. A solely sensor detects motion proximity and yep. presence of nearby objects. So the Nest thermostat also notes if you manually adjust the temperature on the device. Yeah. It, it knows you're standing in front of it and manually adjusting it. Additionally, an occupancy sensor detects if someone's in a room. So motion sensor uses a low energy radar, detects movement and breathing. Other sensors in the Nest Hub, the second generation, detect sounds like snoring and coughing and environmental factors like light and temperature around. Uh-oh. A lot of digital horsepower unrelated to a mechanical system. No, sitting on a wall, gathering data. The largest right. data collection device since the tube television. But where, you know, in, in all of our uh, OEMs, did any of them seek this kind of data? They looked for operational data. So this disrupted the built environment. You know, the major OEMs race to connect with the devices. So here's the disruption. Integration between platforms at one time, as we know, was a manual handshake right. between, let's say, a Johnson Control software tech and the carrier chiller tech to achieve building comfort. So for a time, you know, the BACnet criteria, we're all familiar with BACnet. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but it was tiered to allow one entity to disable, enable, and report alarms. Sure. Or read only or read write. When was the last time you heard that in a sentence in front of a chiller? Read only or read write. So it wasn't sophisticated or intrusive. Sure. But the proprietary algorithms remained locked in what we all know is the corporate black boxes. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. So Boy, that's today, a rabbit hole I can go down for an hour. Ten. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are today. Devices connect to each other without us. At home, when you energize one of your kitchen appliances, an internal algorithm tries to find their new best friend, Alexa, or the Google Home Assistant. Right. My new dishwasher beeps at me once a month, desperately seeking that secret handshake. I'm not going to pull out my phone and accept the offer. <laughs> God, I love, I love that. Yeah. Uh, well, today's so true. devices are based on connectivity. Yeah, absolutely. If it doesn't exist on your phone, does it exist at all? Right. So now we need Freud to get into the conversation. So inquiring minds want to know, but we cannot ignore this thirst for interface with our thumbs on our phone. That's where we get everything important to every one of our students in every classroom. Yeah. Every Everybody that's important is on that phone. Absolutely. If we as instructors are not participating in the ones and zeros through the iPhone, we might be invisible to them. Absolutely. You know, so, I do a class where I talk about the different learning habits of, you know, five to six generations of our world and when we look at some of our youngest students our generation z that is in most of our classrooms right now six to eight hours per day they have their phone on six yes. to eight hours many of us that are gen z that don't think we use the phone we actually average two to four hours and don't particularly realize it no but that that group that's that, that next generation is going to be the most prepared Absolutely. to live and exist and work in a cognitive building because yep. that's the next generation for sustainable systems as they automatically integrate, analyze, and learn from vast amounts of Internet of Things, IoT-generated data yep. within the building it in its environment. As a result, the building itself becomes an assistant and strives to improve satisfaction, but it also drives on cost, and it's enabling innovative cooperative services. So sure. the development of cognitive buildings is made possible by recent advancement and convergence of multiple technologies. Uh, IBM Watson was even involved in, in buildings in Germany, as you, as you may have seen. But our former Secretary of Energy, Dr. Moniz, predicted years ago, every darn thing will be connected to every other darn thing. Sure. 
Yeah. So cognitive buildings aim to take technology beyond automated processes with a more complex integrated approach that looks at a building procedures and provides actionable insights. This combines the use of detailed facility management capabilities and cognitive computing to promote better managed buildings. And don't be mistaken that this is only going into big buildings. It's going to reside in your home also. Absolutely. So We've already seen these energy efficiency contests for highly efficient heat pump applications for residential that are 100% connected. So this application is knocking on our door at the minute. Well, and according to several cognitive building consultants, we need to pivot in our traditional HVAC minds uh, to, to understand conceptually what it is. Think about this. A sensor can, can tell you the accurate temperature, but only a cognitive building can tell you the optimum temperature. Are we ready for that? You, you, you know. Wow. So That's an interesting perspective, too. Right. And on the other side, digital twinning of buildings demand digital literacy, which we'll yeah. talk about soon, too. You know, system performance data must be harvested. Yep, that's, absolutely. that's an adjunct function. The service, commissioning, startup, maintenance, and balancing. That, you know, uh, performance data to prove that those high-performance systems are operating at where they were designed is available to us now. We can grab it. Well, think about the data points that we have on structures, not even just talking about residential. Let's talk about some of our commercial and industrial applications. You know, I spent my last few years out in the field as a mobile engineer. So I worked on new store startups and commissionings, grocery stores that would have usually around 2000 inputs and outputs per building so that you could monitor the performance. And I did a lot of performance monitoring of my refrigeration, my HVAC, my electrical. And so there's a lot of data that is there that some of it was being calculated. Some of it was, you know, being utilized for software, but think about what's happened with the AI industry just this year using artificial intelligence to gather data to make calculations and do formulations. Look at things like chat GPT that just takes words and does calculations from a mass full of input to create an output and then calculates that to be the most efficient. Well, I think we're going to see a lot of that in a very, very short period of time for not just our commercial industrial, but even on our residential applications. Right. And, and some of the more, you know, aggressive contractors and control contractors have already told me that they are so interested in getting to the cognitive building level. Yes. Because it's not just about is the compressor on what speed the compressor's at. How well is it? If you're managing controls for a ten story building. Yep. And that and you and, and and let me let me separate cognitive buildings from a let's say a medicine system or a carrier system. You know, when when you get in a room and discuss with uh say at the you mentioned the AHRI show, there's a lot of discussions there about capturing this data. And when you uh, what, there's some platforms and Ocean Alliance, for instance, says, oh, yeah. we can put four, we have four or 500 devices that we communicate with. And I said, well, what's your front end? I get a blank stare. There's no front end. They don't know. They don't care. They don't know it's where it's going. In, it's data in and it's trended in a way that, for instance, uh, if every Saturday there's a meeting in, the, in a conference room on the third floor of the south wing, then Saturday morning, they're going to make sure the elevator's running. If it's, uh, depending on what time of year it is, I'll make sure the parking lot lights are on in the south. Exactly. Room. And also, if it's a conference room, we're going to ventilate that room with more air. And I've talked to control contractors that said, you, you want to know when the lights come on or when the elevator's on? He said, I absolutely want to know. That's my building. I want that data. I want to know everything is, that's operating in that building. So there's a thirst for us to go kind of beyond our guardrails, our HVAC guardrails. Our comfort say. levels. Yeah. yeah, their comfort level and because it builds trust and a relationship with the owner. Wow. So a lot of things. How to make your brain just soak yeah. in for a minute. <laughs> oh, wow. So when we start talking about these higher performance infrastructures and we're talking about the communicating capabilities of them, uh, let's dive a little bit deeper and let's talk about, you know, what can we do for energy within these and how can we utilize and manage energy within these buildings, just like you're talking about. Well, and we can. And and, and sometimes I, we hear the phrase coined about, you know, traditional heat transfer versus modern heat transfer. Yeah. To be sure, we're still going to move a BTU. So right. 
you know, in in today's world, though, the discussion of green buildings might be in the rearview mirror. IAPMO sustainable committees have been disbanded because the language and subsequent fuel behaviors have been normalized into the main body of the mechanical and plumbing codes. Over at ICC, they've already produced guidance for commercial and residential electrification. So yeah. green buildings have evolved into high performance structures. Uh, you know, a generation ago when we did something green, like put a uh, hose in a box and paint it black, put it on a roof and we heated our pool. <laughs> that was that was a great idea. Right. It's a good idea. But, but now, you know, basic heat transfer ideology is beyond is moving beyond heat from somewhere we don't want it to somewhere, you know, that where we need it. So modern heat transfer strategies will be we're going to be moving heat from building to building. Ah, now in we're heating these, somewhere. Yes. In these concepts, we're going to move into now moving, you know, large blocks of heat and, and reusing it. Let yeah. be without fear, air, water, and refrigerant still move by fan pumps and compressors. The irreducible yeah. pieces are still in place. So but think about this. The industry, as an industry, we've already acknowledged the concept. Variable flow arrangements, known by their corporate abbreviations, VRV, VRF, you know, are, they're not the ductless split systems of the past. Those are multiple components, and they make up an applied system. Yep. Something designed for collecting heat from one area of the building Just moving and it. depositing in an area calling for heat. So BTUs are not wasted to the ambient air. So why not apply the same heat transfer principles to hydronic equipment? Then when you start getting into that, now there's incentives. Now you start getting rewarded for moving heat and reusing heat. Illinois, we're, we're uh, on the escrow sort of me. Yep. had more than 21 pro 20 programs in 2021. So that's an old, old data point. Uh, the other good news is there are a lot of groups out there that even offer compensation for training. So in the state of Maine, they have a heat pump positive program. They have a couple of technical schools and also our UA local registered to train on heat pumps with a catch. If you want to collect that training money, you have to be tied to a, an OEM. So if you have a, huh. a Mitsubishi skid in your platform using, yeah. and you're teaching some of the Mitsubishi or Daikin or whoever, some of their uh, components, then you're rewarded by the state of Maine for partnering and for and for teaching you know does that make sense yeah all comes into education that's right and then you know the nice sort grant is on there we want to thank our friends over at north park innovation and bill north absolutely yeah. they were involved in a program back in, in 2019 yeah there was training across the state of new york on on heat pumps and we were happy to have eugene silverstein lead that class on heat pumps but it also there too the caveat was you got to harvest the data. Right. You got to be able, you're going to put that heat pump in right. You're going to start it, commission it, and catch the data mm -hmm. before the incentive shows up. Yep, so, makes sense. Why not? You know, it's so one thing to say that a piece of equipment is capable of doing something. It's another to validate it. Yeah. Well, right, right now, but that's where that's where we are demanded to go. Yeah. And because that that data is available to be harvested and we now have HVAC tools in yep. place to allow it to, to happen without a software degree. Yeah. You know, let's face it, we're we have tool pouches. We don't you know we don't write code. We don't we don't need to write code. It's already out there. The, the integration is available and helps us. So again thanks to Eugene uh, for, for helping that program and also North Park and, and, and Bill North. Fantastic. Wow. So a whole lot to talk about with um, transferring heat. And, you know, you mentioned on something a while ago about moving a BTU. Um, how many times can we reuse a BTU? Is it inevitable? Is this, does it reduce well, its potential? Another term we're going to hear will be thermal energy exchange networks. Okay. So, so that, you know, and, and we're not going to see it soon because it's already here. It's on college campuses, it's in large cities, and all this, a lot of the semiconductor projects being built around the country, it exists. So thermal energy networks are utility-scale infrastructure projects that connect multiple buildings into a shared network with multiple sources of thermal energy. 
So are you prepared to manage, as you said, a perpetual BTU? Mm -hmm. uh, Jay Egg of AZ Thermal coined that phrase. We're going to get in credit, but let's think about when you reuse it, then it, it becomes, uh, it'll be there forever as long as you want to pick it up and move it again. Right. So he's one of the leading designers that transfer heat without wasting the energy, for example. And you may even want to eliminate the cooling tower because he, again, is not expelled out into the atmosphere. Sure. We just need to move it where it's needed or where so, it doesn't matter where it's at. That's correct. There's a lot of places to move heat at in, in large cities. There is a, you know, when you start creating a thermal energy network, you're seeing buildings, you're seeing uh, connected. And how simple do you think it would be to do that? You're seeing some underground piping here. Yeah. Okay, so what's out there now to help us? You know, uh, what's in place existing? Sure. We have steam plants. We have central plants on college campuses. Absolutely. Underground steam lines, underground sewer lines, lines. Sewer lines. We have central plants in large cities with underground steam grids. So if we get rid of the, the chillers, boilers, and and cooling towers and start working a thermal exchange either with a borehole or, or other devices, now we have in place somewhere a, a grid, you know, to convey the system. Yeah. This is Cornell University. They, uh, they're they looking to reimagine their central plant steam grid. The designs are in place to convert it to a hydronic system capable of moving heat between the campus buildings. So we're, we're getting outside the, 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 the comfort level of yeah. our heat pump through the refrigerant because we live it and we understand it, work on it every day. Now we're going to look at systems that will pick up heat hydronically. Yeah, There's just re re-implement the heat that's already there. Yeah. Also, also there's there's buildings in, you know, a six block radius in New York City with 22 buildings will train heat, trade heat from where it's not needed yeah. to where it is needed. And in other news, you know, in the Bronx, there's two apartment buildings that will soon get their heating and cooling from hot water, uh, from wastewater and geothermal energy. So no that, more money down the drain. Literally no more money down the drain. Yeah, that brings up a great point. I just had a conversation a couple weeks ago with a large contractor that's doing a heat recovery wastewater treatment engineered project. So they're removing heat from all of the wastewater at their sewage treatment facility. I said, well, that's an interesting. He said, yeah, it's free heat if we need heat someplace. I thought, oh my gosh, it is. Well, well anytime, again, let, let's think about the, the universal law that we discussed earlier. If there's one degree temperature difference, the heat's going to go somewhere without help. Exactly. If you want to go uphill, that's where the, that's where the pumps are. That's and, where we have to pump it. Yeah. But when somebody identifies a source of heat uh, that has a, a large temperature difference uh, that can be captured, then then everybody wins. Hmm. It's win-win for everybody. You know, there are some, getting back to semiconductors, those projects out west with large semiconductor uh, buildings, you know, where there's a lot of heat in those blade farms, where actually some of the heat will be captured, pipe under the road and heat a farmer's field. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, sure. you, it doesn't get any better than that, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds great to me. It makes yeah, more so, sense. That increased you know, crop production. Sure. And... Yeah. If, so I'm not saying chillers and boilers and cooling towers will be extinct, but they're kind of going to be designed away from it uh, because each building may still have a heat pump for heating and cooling or exchanging thermal heat, and the water in the pipes will maintain temperature with the need, within the needed range of exchanging heat. And... Here's the twist here. Here's here's the goal we need to get to to make it uh, more palatable to be a national uh, in, initiative. Uh, and and it, there again, we go back to New York State. They passed legislation establishing the Utility Thermal Energy Network and Jobs Act yep. to promote the development of thermal energy networks throughout the state to provide jobs of transition utility networks who have lost or are at risk of losing their employment. Hmm. So creating a utility model may allow wider distribution and access for all communities. So one obstacle for the OEMs may be to upscale heat pump families to solve a 50-story high-rise. But back to your, what you said at the very start of the broadcast about uh, that BTU, you know, moving BTUs, once that BTU becomes a, 
a therm of gas or a kil kilowatt of electricity, guess what? Now there's a way to pay for yeah. the infrastructure movement and it's the pain. Energy, and it's health. fuel. Yeah. Yeah. Now it becomes that's a great term. We we gotta call it JA. That perpetual BTU now becomes a fuel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you monetize fuel easily? Everyone pays for fuel in some form or another. That's right. And we already have BTU meters that yeah. are at, at the steam station. When you're making hot water out of the steam, you're counting the number of BTU screens. So that's not foreign to, right. to anybody. Wow. Yeah. That's it really brings up some interesting perspectives on how we utilize our utilities. I mean, we're we're probably going to be going through a change in our perspective of utilities. In the past, it's been you get water, you get natural gas, maybe propane, you get electric, and you get sewage. Well, in the future, what does utilities look like? What do you need? Well, I, I think in the future, all three choices you mentioned are, are still going to be available, certainly in our lifetimes, because according to the Energy Information Administration, assuming the same annual rate of U.S. dry natural gas production from 2021, the U.S. has enough dry gas to last about 86 years. Yeah, of course, the actual number of years will depend on the actual amount of dry gas produced sure. and changes in natural gas. But this is one of the more difficult puzzles to solve because a lot of information, you know, as you, as you noted with the three types of energy, there's a lot of lobbies out there trying to you know, looking for the lead position as a source of energy generation and distribution. Yeah. But if we can, one thing they're doing in England is is uh, is taking the natural gas grids and creating micro districts that we'll talk about here in a few minutes. Reutilizing the infrastructure. That that's correct, but it wow. may not be for something. It may be for a reason that could surprise everybody. But moving towards in the U.S. You know, utilities to build for BTUs. There's our path. There, there's our path. That, that's how we get there. Everybody says, "Well, gee, you know, you know, Cliff, you know, that, all the stuff you're talking about is nice. But I don't see a path to get there." I think New York, the template New York used to create a utility model, gives everybody hope that it can be funded in a way that's not a burden to the it's rest. Scalable. Yes. Hmm. Scalable was the key word here on all of this, because until it's scalable, affordable, and producible, it's going to struggle. It's going to sputter. But we're reaching thresholds that are getting past those obstacles. Well, yeah. Well, look at the you know, rising cost of utilities. When we look at some of our resources, just say natural gas or even our electrical generation, you know, at some point we have to be able to look at our utilities and go, are there better options? Okay. Funny you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> because we have to look at now an, another fuel type that's being developed. This is an interesting one. So it's it's more than in, in, interesting. And again, you know, one of the projects in the UK actually where they took a town and they're moving street by street through this town using the gas grid to supply it with hydrogen. And additionally, they're going house by house and putting in hydrogen appliances for heating water, for cooking. And for, and, for, and for heating and boiler, those, wow. those those devices exist. We'll talk about exactly. that in a few minutes. But at the same time, that is something we we need to wrap our heads around. But we also have to feel comfortable that you know we manage natural gas. We, we live with it. We, we cook. You know, there, there's no mystery there. Nope. If we can, you know, and I'll use this phrase. I'll, I'll, I'll overuse this phrase. We need to learn, unlearn, and relearn uh, <laughs> deep water and, and heat our house. Because, exactly. You know, because how soon is it going to be, you know, consumable? And what utility model then makes that affordable? Right. And how long before building codes can normalize hydrogen boilers and domestic water heaters? NFPA right now is forming committees to talk about, uh, you know, hydrogen. We're, we're trying to set up in our training center in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, where the annual training takes place, we we have a a pad and a room set up. <coughs> excuse me. Well, we want to set a hydrogen tank. When when the remodeling was going on, we said to the architect and the fire marshal, uh, "What what do we what fire rating do we need on the walls to put a hydrogen boiler, uh, stove, and a and a hot water uh, heater in this lab so we can learn how to do service?" Yeah, absolutely. What? 
hydrogen. You want to put a hydrogen tank outside that building? Wait, what? <laughs> right. What is hydrogen? Tell me about it. But there's no guidance. For <laughs> right. The industry, the manufactured product, once again, is getting ahead of, you know, NFPA, yeah. IAPMO, ICC, you know, and, and also training enough people to be comfortable again, you know, with this. So just as carbon is a building block of the fossil fuels, the economy, hydrogen will be the building block of the clean energy economy, in which that. renewable electricity, hydrogen, both gases and liquid, ammonia and other synthetics will dominate when, to produce, store and move clean energy. Yeah. Hydrogen's flexibility as zero carbon fuel and clean energy carrier is the bridge to clean electricity, making it the missing piece to fully decarbonize uh, the, the economy. Wow. So we, we mentioned multiple projects in the UK, but let's look at here in the US. Long Ridge Energy uh, Generation Project plans that is a plan to develop combined cycle facility as carbon free hydrogen burning power plant to improve its energy efficiency and reduce its carbon footprint. The power plant will help provide low cost energy to Ohio. It'll be the first power plant of its kind in the US to generate electricity by burning a blend of hydrogen and gas. In a, in a combustion chairman. Wow. Here's better news. The shuttered power plants, the coal plants that may not be closing, they are sweet spots. They have infrastructure, piping, pumps available to generate and distribute hydrogen. They can so be they, converted. They will, they will, that's right. They will, they will be sites that aren't going to lay in waste because we've abandoned burning coal. Now we're going to look at, at, at hydrogen. Right. So, at the uh, federal level, we have the Oak Ridge National Lab Research to develop yeah. a single burner cooking appliance powered by a blend of 50% hydrogen natural gas, reducing emissions, emissions that contribute to the carbon footprint. So when you look at the ability to generate and distribute, now we have the ability to, to have this in our houses. Leading manufacturers, Bradford White, Bosch, they have boilers, hot water, uh, heaters and cooking appliances already in their labs. Not ready for prime time, but still, I mean, it's, if it's know, in R&D, it's around the corner. Well, with your R&D, then it helps that product mature yeah. a, a little quicker. So it gets us where we're looking to go uh, uh, a little quicker. So <laughs> you and I have really, we push the all, I think, on the discussion. Yeah. Somebody you know, has to. I feel like a bell ringer sometimes going, hey, we can't sustain what we're doing. Let's make some changes. I mean, just think about that. 87 years of natural gas. Okay. My grandchildren I, I are going to see the day. I, I wish I could call you the Paul Revere of the HVAC industry. But a lot of this is already here. Yeah. It's here. We have technicians in the field living it. We have contractors installing it. It's being designed. We have inspectors in Seattle arguing over, is it a plumbing permit? Is it a mechanical permit? It's here. We've right. gone through the threshold. We're, we're living it. Yeah, we're actually behind pace on being prepared as an industry. Right. So we're, we're going to focus on educators here in a minute because that's who we want. That's who keeps the 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 revolution intact. Without properly educated technicians out there in the field uh, that are anxious to work on these, it's uh, it's going to be a house of cards. But look at the other stakeholders. So we, we need to meet the challenge where we live. How do all these groups synchronize their effort to unify their goals? And the primary challenge lies, again, in behavior modification and vocabulary. We need to behave and speak in a uniform in a uniform way. And that's on us as educators, too. Absolutely, it is. And, and all of us, everybody on this screen right now, we have, if We're we can responsible. stop being in silos, speaking shorthand to each other, we can create a system of harmonious engagement and enhance reliable, repeatable delivery of the high performance systems. So there are things everybody can think about doing. Everybody, every stakeholder has a role. Every stakeholder uh, has to be part of the successful transition to, to high performance in infrastructure. And that's going to lie. The, the basis is not just the inspectors, not just the contractors, and what they need to do, prepare with their staffs and their sure. administrators. But guess what? The original manufacturers have a lot of things out there that, that, that they can help us learn and understand. Sure can. But here's the key. 
high-performance infrastructure is going to rely on a high-skilled workforce. So we need to strategically plan and get the right information at the right time at the right quality to make the right decisions. So as instructors, let's engage to align OEM training with e-transfer principles. Why? Yeah, technology is forcing the market into unique, unique, not proprietary, but unique offerings. So let's go back to the VRF, the variable flow system. Yep. So you wish that, you know, how many times has somebody said to you, Clint, can we just have a variable cl flow class with two credits and we learn all things variable flow? Sorry, we don't have, we don't have good news here because right. the variable flow systems, they're, they're not produced like rooftops. You know, on bid day, the contractor can, with confidence, offer the lowest RTU price to the owner because they're interchangeable. Lifting and stalling the train RTU is similar to a carrier in the marketplace. But VRB and VRF bids, those suppliers give a component list, a piping schematic, and a wiring diagram for Very the project. Very specific for the project. They're none alike. We don't get a, a, a wiring diagram to bid a rooftop or a chiller. Right. We don't get a piping schematic. They're interchangeable. But the technology and everything we talked about, thermal energy networks, clean energy, hydrogen, they're all very specific to how the manufacturer built them to perform. So let's look at our and develop our critical thinking skills. And it'll be essential when we're confronted with so much information from different formats for searching, sifting, evaluating, applying, producing. And that, that all requires us to think critically. Yeah. So communication is a key aspect of digital literacy. Yeah. Very we're advanced skill sets. In virtual environments. In, in a digital twin, let's say, the ability to clearly express your ideas, ask relevant questions, maintain respect, and build trust is just as important when communicating in person. Mm. So I, I have one more, you know, uh, quote to offer when you look at high-skilled labor. A recent Forbes yes. article, Mark Cohen, asked the readers this simple question. Why has upskilling suddenly become so important? Mm. It's been a sudden Surge to, to get to upskill everybody because of how quickly the technology turns over. Because Mark Cohen would agree with you. He said it's the digital transformation. It According is. to him, the digital economy, enabled by an astonishing advances in technology, is reimagining the provider customer dynamic, transforming how goods and services are bought and sold. So, customer centric, tech enabled, well capitalized new model providers are disrupting. Again, there's that word disrupting, disrupting. Incumbent, you know, processes across the industry. So there's, you know, they share several core characteristics, relentless commitment to improve customer access, experience and loyalty, the efficient use of data as the new oil, achieving more with less for the benefit of customers, employees and shareholders, along with constant improvement. Their models are built from customer perspective, not to fit the provider economic model. So as educators, when we begin with the end in mind, when we look at our lesson plan, the end in mind of that employable student, the challenges today push us all to learn, unlearn, and relearn the HVAC industry. So, uh, yeah, Cliff, I, I want to thank you for wow. this talk. <laughs> I want to thank everybody out there for attending. And you've got a great staff. The, the ESCO staff is always leaning forward. Every one of the, the ESCO, the HVAC excellence members out on the field, they lean forward into these subjects. And they're unafraid to have that discussion. It's not its not unattractive for you guys. Yeah. Because a, a lot of consultants, a, a lot of uh, uh, federal agencies and, and, and policymakers look to you with that question, of, are we ready for this? Who, who installs a hot water heat pump? Because... The consultants want to know. They know that if you, you're helping HVAC next get trained in many of the schools that you accredit, but they also know you're not teaching plumbing in that school. Exactly. So they're asking that question. Who's got this? So it's good to know that you always lean forward. You've got this. And the rest of the industry can benefit from just having this conversation. I am so blessed to have met you.
<laughs> I, I honestly am. Yeah. You know, sometimes yeah. it's a difficult line to walk. When, when you look at technology and you have a respect for technology and change and know that it's coming and are willing to step out of line and help people prepare without naysaying some of the effects, because there are always going to be negative effects to change. There are always going to be some difficult things, difficult hurdles to get past. And how do you get past them? Education and preparation. That's the only way. Okay, then since you already used the word blessed, then I'm going to go one step farther and say, we don't need to fear the storm. No. We are the storm. Yeah. And we're going to make, we can make good things happen. And the bottom line is, in keeping our, our students safe and our technicians safe, that always leads to public health and consumer protection safety. So, so true. Wow. Um, you know, there is so much that has been unpacked here. Uh, there'll be a lot of people wanting to come back, view this, dive into it a little bit deeper, learn more about the UA. And I highly encourage anyone that's on right now to grab a quick snapshot, grab your phone, get a picture of that QR. This will get you into the UA.org site. So you can learn more about the UA and the partnerships that UA has throughout the entire industry. A lot of people look at UA as go, oh, that's just the union. They only do commercial industrial. They work on specific things in the industry. And the UA is a partner for the entire HVACR industry. It's a path to success for an entire movement of technology that doesn't always get recognized. And we're so blessed to have this partnership with well, you. Well, no, thanks for saying that, Cliff, because a lot of people in the audience may not realize that when you see a Johnson truck, a carrier truck, a Dyken truck, Honeywell, Siemens, they're, they're our labor partners. We That's train right. them. The guys in those trucks are trained in our training centers. We help them understand some of the most complex systems. And also, you know, residential and light commercial systems, too. There's a path for all of it. So we appreciate your endorsement. And uh, for folks to be unafraid about learning about, uh, you know, how how that business model works to the to benefit uh, the HVAC industry. Yeah. Cody just asked a question, how to get the QR code. Cody, right there on the screen, that right-hand side that has that UA. You can, if you're on your phone watching this, just go ahead and screenshot it. Um, you can come back and grab it later. If you're on your computer, just open up your camera and your camera will grab that QR and that'll take you right to it. And it'll stay here in the chat box for a little bit too, for anyone that wants to grab that. We still got a little bit of time. Anyone have any questions or positive comments that they want to bring to this conversation? Oh, we're going to hear the bad stuff too. Come on. Let's, 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 <laughs> I'll, I'll get error. that in email. Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> They'll haunt me for weeks sometimes. <laughs> uh, no doubt. But also, Cliff, if, if you get questions into your office, uh, yeah. post uh, event here, uh, and, and uh, I'll support you know getting getting answers to you and, and helping. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Benkowski. This is a, an honor to have someone from the industry that has seen these changes, not just once, but an evolution of change. And there's going to be more down the road. We don't even know what's to come. We just want to make sure that we are prepared for the things that we are aware of. Exactly. Well, again, thank you for, uh, for your help, and I appreciate the opportunity. Anytime. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us and we will see you next week on Did You Know? The ESCO HVAC Show and we'll continue diving deeper into these uh, hot topics. All see right. you all later. You bet.